very good morning to all of you once again on the e platform of ls law college we have one very eminent personality with us honorable mr justice swatantra kumarji who has been former chairperson of ngt and a uh, former judge at supreme court of india sir we are indeed very happy and very glad to have you with us on the e platform of gls law college i am sure that all the students law fraternity and all the viewers will be very happy to be with your lordship with us on this platform uh, i request director of gls law college dr mayuri pandya welcome and greet Honorable Mr. Justice Kumar, over to you, Mayuri Ma'am. Thank you, Madam. Uh, it is indeed my pride and privilege to welcome Honorable Mr. Justice Kumar Sir uh, today uh, for his uh, special address uh, to all our students. Uh, when it comes to the environment justice. And uh, especially when we talk about the efficient and the expeditious environment justice, the only name that stands in my mind is Honorable Mr. Justice Swadhanpata Kumar Sir. So I heartily welcome you on behalf of GLS Law College and Gujarat Law Society on our this e platform for today's address. Uh, the one of the, the most important thing that we Lordship has uh, uh, introduced, and uh, that is the practice of the consultative process of all the stakeholders. I think that in environmental justice, the most important thing is the consultative process of all the stakeholders, and uh, being, uh, especially all the viewers and all the students, uh, all are aware that for the environmental justice. Uh, it's not only the environmental law, only the one thing, but it's a, uh, the subject where you need to have all the state, you need a scientist, you need to have the knowledge of geography, you need to have, it's a, it, you need all the stakeholders, not only the judiciary, advocates, uh, pollution control boards, all the stakeholders, if they are on the one platform, then only I think that the environmental justice uh, truly, in its true spirit, can be done. And today we have the Kimberly, the Lordship, who has contributed to the environmental justice of India. Sir, so I once again welcome you to GLS Law College. Over to Parima. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, sir, as Mayuri ma'am rightly said that you are the right person if you wish to talk anything about uh, landmark judgments and uh, the process that had happened into NGT. Uh, we are really very happy that you are with us today. And we are very proud to say that Sir has been an academic scholar in his uh, academic career and had delivered, as ma'am said, in one day, in one single day. 209 judgments were disposed by I think that is an epitome of during his tenure. It is a very uh, proud moment for us as well to hear about that. That has been awarded uh, on national and international with many of the recognized awards. And, Sir has been a member of UDIP as well. Uh, sir, it's completely over to you. It is the lighthouse to environmental injustice. Lighthouse to environmental uh, injustice and the role of NGT in India. So we are all yours to listen it directly from. Sir, it's over to you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Pandey and Dr. Mehta, firstly, I must uh, compliment uh, your institute for 
having picked up a subject on environment which in the present time is very vital when the very existence of humanity is challenged well i hope the members of the faculty and both ladies being the in charge of the affairs of the institute i'm sure it must be doing very well well coming to the topic that you have given me is with regard to the intervention and experiences on the environmental jurisdiction now dear students and all the attendees let's just first get into the basics of environmental jurisprudence the first and the foremost document in our country is the constitution of india now if you read the very preamble of the constitution of india it talks of india being a secular sovereign and social state secular sovereign and social states it then aims to give to people of india justice social economic and political now how do we give to our people or how did the framers of the constitution thought of providing these three fundamental justices because justice they did not mean simplicity or administration of justice system in our country they meant much more than that and that was the social economic and political justice out of these two are very fundamental to our existence one is social and other is the economic Now, how do you secure social and economic justice is by providing people equality in terms of health the economic rights social rights and ensure that the people of the country are able to come to the fore being fully satisfied with dispensation of such governance by the government that they feel economically and socially secure you know you cannot be or a country or anybody in the world cannot be socially and economically well off unless and until you have a healthy environment and healthy people around you because the economics of a country totally depend on the health stata of that country now when we talk of health stata of that country means you should have good health when will you have good health when you have clean environment now three things that is water air and land all these three have to be clean to make this planet worth of living maybe you will get down from a beautiful mercedes car but the moment you get out of it you need to breathe fresh air you may be any traveler you may be rich you may be poor but what you need to do is some clean water to drink and some space on this planet on this land to live and i would in fact open the talk with a very fundamental principle which has been stated by one of the professors because academicians are really great contributory 
to the development of a country. You know, it is said that the COVID-19 is a signal from God to the people on the planet that you are the occupants of this planet and not owners of this planet. So let's read the whole environmental jurisprudence within the framework of this single sentence. Straight away coming to the environment, if you see the latest environmental law enforces the Environmental Protection Act 1986. Now section two of that act defines the word environment and interestingly potent also. When it talks of environment, it's an inclusive definition. As you know, being students of the law, that inclusive definition has a meaning to it. And it is not ordinary definition. It is little above the normal definition, which is provided, but for being inclusive. Now, inclusive means that it includes air, land, and water. After it says these three things, that is the land, air, and water, then the next thing that straight away comes is that environment includes these three elements. But most interesting thing in our environmental jurisprudence in our country is that the framers defined it in, with such wide magnitude and added the words that it will be uh, human beings and interrelation between land, water, earth, air, and human beings, and most importantly, living creatures, plants, microorganisms. So imagine. If we think of this environment, does it mean that you can leave anything, even an insect, in that big forest is part of our environment? Anything flowing in the river is part of our environment. A small pond, a sea, everything is part of our environment, including the human beings. Pollutant has been said anything that in such concentration it exists that it will or it is likely to or tend to pollute the environment. So such is the definition. These two words constitute the entire environmental jurisprudence in our country. Now with this background, let's go to the constitution itself. Under the Constitution, you have the obligation on the state to protect environment and natural resources in terms of the directive principles. In terms of the constitutional duties, the citizens are obliged to protect the environment, natural resources, and environment has to be what I mentioned to you, not environment in its narrower sense or in its linguistic terms but in the terms in which it has been defined under our laws. Now, after that, the Supreme Court expanded the scope, that is doctrine of expansion of jurisdiction, where the right to decent and clean environment was treated as a fundamental right. So this is the constitutional pedestal of environment in our Indian constitution as per the framers. We proceed further that how do we enact laws of environment in our country? Are there are two basic sources, three. One is the statutory source, that is the legislator makes laws with regard to environment in exercise of the powers vested in the state of the center as per the lists of the schedule. Now, the other is the most important in terms of Article 253 of the Constitution, that where 
you have made international commitments and you make law in your country to fulfill that international commitments and all our major laws air pollution act water pollution prevention act and the environmental protection act all three have been enacted in furtherance to india's commitment and the international treaties or conventions or agreements now this is the gamut of legislative law of jurisprudence or the environment law in our country now ngt itself the national green tribunal was created by the act of the parliament 2010 after the supreme court had passed a judgment that you should have specialized tribunals not only for environment even for other uh, specialized subjects and the supreme court said that you should have experts along with the judges to do environmental justice so with that intention we have in the national green tribunal it is not the judges who do justice or administer the environmental justice but it is the experts now they can be the professors they can be the scientists they can be the people who have worked in the environment in ministries or other places so you have to have more than 15 to 20 years of specialized work in the field of environment and uh, you know i'm very happy to inform you that uh, when i was working in the ntt we even have an iit professor as uh, one of the member expert members of the ntt so we had a very very people with great acumen to assist and help and they were not helping in that sense they were advised not advisors they were people of full vote full right to hear and decide in their own selves so they were like any other judge who was sitting that is the judge with the judicial experience who was presiding the bench the biggest advantage was that there was a collective wisdom exercised by the ngt to do environmental justice because legally you may be able to resolve an issue but it may not be technically feasible to implement that particular decision or it may prove to be counterproductive then what you wish to achieve by passing a particular order or the direction so it was intention of the legislature was to mix the expertise knowledge with judicial knowledge to make dispensation of environmental justice in our country expeditious inexpensive effective and result oriented and i think that the national green tribunal was able to achieve those objects quite fairly now let me just before i take you to some cases or experiences let me just tell you what is the sense of environment to your students see we should talk of environment and uh, as gandhi ji said that every or the planet or the earth has enough resources for the need of people or everyone but not for the greed so the first principle is conflict of economic interests with environmental principles that is the first problem we face second is that when we talk of development we go hereby we think that development should carry on no matter how much damage does it do is it a irreparable irreversible damage to the natural resources while we are carrying out the development next which happens is that environmental protection being ignored and not effectively implemented by regulatory agencies then comes the people who intentionally like to flout law 
they like to disobey the regulatory measures and just for a small economic or other gains they like to vitiate the environment causing serious hazardous problems then as you know that there are different kind of intentional disposal of variety of wastes including medical waste including normal domestic waste then you have your technological wastes then you have the other sewage you have other hundred kind of wastes which are generated by human activity on the planet and all of them are disposed of in a very very irresponsible manner causing environmental hazards now if we say that these are the universal problems they may vary in terms of degree but by and large they are existing across the world especially in developing countries and south asian countries this problem is pretty serious now to deal with this the principles are applicable across the globe you have three principles one is doctrine of sustainable development two precautionary principle and third is polluter pays principle now these three principles if rightly applied would cover all these six pragmatic or challenges to the environment which i have just mentioned so if you do that you can apply these three principles the national green tribunal act 2010 in fact under section 20 statutory incorporates these three principles and makes it obligatory on the part of the national tribunal to apply those principles to do justice of environment to the people who complain of environmental degradation or environmental violations now this is the legal framework just kindly keep these broad principles in mind they were more informative for your uh, you know appreciation of the following talk what i propose to tell you now is that in the national green tribunal and even the courts when i was in the supreme court or bombay high court you know we were able to deal with environmental cases quite effectively because you know we had the uh, you know in bombay if you have seen right from the marin drive down to the airport side the sea border ahead of uh, you know the various colonies that fall the people were putting material into the sea and putting boards of advertisement right in the middle of the sea shore line now that was a matter which probably one of the first few cases that one had to deal with and we had to pass those directions that people were putting boards in the marabar hills therefore destroying the trees you know there was kind of people were sensitive to that it was a happy or a healthy attitude of the society that people complained of such violations which were set right by judge comes the major challenges in the national green tribunal were the projects of mainly forest rivers pollution of rivers glaciers industrial pollution and waste management besides hundreds of other cases which came up for hearing which affected a class of people or a very limited number of people but these were the cases which were 
at large, like everybody was being affected. Now, talking to you about Delhi, and I think I should mention about Bangalore, because you would be more familiar with that area. Now, that was with regard to the Belundra Lake in Bangalore, which, you know, people were putting anything and everything into the lake. They were putting chemicals, they were putting sewage, they were putting waste, they were putting anything and everything into, and this happens to be one of the biggest lakes in the country, which is, has a circumference of every nine kilometers. And, uh, you know, there was then so much of chemical reaction and uh, things were there that, you know, the foam used to be built up and the foam would with the air come on the main roads to the extent that there would be accidents or the cars you can't drive because the extent of foam that used to be thrown out was terrible and therefore it was causing a lot of hazardous uh, you know, environmental damage. Now people were even building on the, you know, just on the edge or the bank of these big lakes. Now for example, Bangalore, you know, to begin with had around about 682 water bodies, if I don't mistake and subject to correction. Uh, today it has some hundred odd. Out of that, majority of them are polluted ones. So Bangalore, which was at one time called the city of lakes and an air conditioned city of India, now has nothing but air conditioners. And there is every possibility because some of the people hinted at the international level that there may be water problems in Bangalore and a very serious ones. Now the question that arose in the tribunal was concerned as to what should it do. There were, you know, conflicting arguments between the state government, between the local authorities and the people who were trying to come around and raise complaints. So you had three different versions and each one of them claimed to be equally authenticated for the purposes of larger public interest and environmental interest. So we had to take very harsh decisions in that case. We had to prohibit construction at least 50 meters to 100 meters away from the bank of these lakes. We had to stop the builder or the buildings to put their sewage into the lake. We had to direct cleaning of the lake. We had to pass other harsh orders, including that for a short time, even the industries around those lakes were directed to shut down and there were injunction against them. Then we had even laid compensation, industrial compensation, the environmental compensation payable by the industries, by the builders and other people who used to pollute this lakes to that extent. So if you see now what happened was that, why do you stop construction? Because you stop construction to keep in mind the principle of sustainable development. Once you keep the principle of sustainable development, regulations in regard to building laws should be obeyed. But at the same time, in addition to that, you should not raise construction within the area which is otherwise prohibited under the uh, different laws near the country, uh, near these lakes. So they may be, it may be an area which is prohibited or which is not prohibited, but which is regulated area. So if there is a regulated area, you follow the law, prohibited area means you don't raise construction. 
Now, the other thing was the precautionary principle, which I mentioned to you. Now, we issued various directions where you will take different precautions. That means you will not discharge the F2Ns which are beside or violating the prescribed parameters under the law. You would not. So the, they were stopped for a while and then they were directed to bring their affluence within the prescribed limit so that you can protect the lake and the government and the local authorities were directed to clean that lake as soon as possible. Now, the Pluto Pace principle was applied by imposing environmental compensation and fines on the industries, on other, uh, you know, industries, local authorities, and or the builders who were violating the law and had raised constructions which were infringing the regulated or the prohibited area uh, adjacent to these lakes. So, this was the gamut of this one case which I told you that has caused very serious problem. Now just coming to Delhi for a while, uh, you know, Delhi has two very major problems at the relevant time. One was waste management because Delhi, you will be surprised to know that Delhi was generating and in fact is generating even today and more than 9,400 metric tons of waste every day. Now, how do you manage that waste? Firstly, it is not segregated. Secondly, it's very difficult to dispose of this quantum of waste by, you know, not unless until you have complete mechanism and cooperation from different ends. Now they were like, you know, they have the, you know, hills of dumps in Delhi. You have three of them and one of them even was so bad that it fell. It has already crossed the height of 75 meters, which is uh, beyond 30 is if not proper. Now, since the waste was so heavy and so dangerous that it used to generate gases, you know, methane is generated because of the waste collection, which is not kept properly and stored properly with mud layer, the segregation and layer turning. Whatever the scientific directions could be passed and has been provided under the waste management rules, they were being violated. So you had to take very harsh steps. You know, even the people died on that waste dump. The cars were put into the difficulty. So. What is happening is that uh, what is happening is that you have such a serious problem of waste management in Delhi that it is impossible to handle it unless and until you have full compliance to the waste management rules of different kinds. And what you need to really do basically is firstly the home where the waste is generated, they must have segregation. Then the transportation to the deposit point must be done in a very proper segregated manner. Segregated waste should be transported with due care so that you don't hurt the environment or you do not cause difficulties in a way that it will be injurious to because as I told you, the waste itself is injurious to environment and health. It generates gases. It has other issues which are very, very difficult to manage. You know, you have the, you know, there was a time when even the waste was spread on the roads of Delhi somewhere, but then directions were passed in that behalf also. Now, this waste then should be treated. You should have waste to energy, plants or you should have you know other waste to pallets or you should have other waste plants which will treat this plant and convert it into you know the very sophisticated title given is waste to wealth so you should be able to convert it into a value whatever that value might be 
and then you should be able to generate power. Now there are three plants in Delhi, they were not able to handle this waste. Now they're trying to, there are some waste to management plants, there were a lot of objections that they should not, they cause pollution themselves, which they were causing to some extent. So they were different directions were passed. Now let me tell you how we handled that case within the framework of the provisions of the National Green Tribunal and the various laws that are applicable. First was direction with regard to point segregation and household segregation of the waste. Then transportation of the case, directions were issued and there are regulations to that effect how and in what manner should you carry out the waste. Then you have how would a plant from waste to energy to operate. Again, there is a question that they have to sell the power to somebody, somebody state should buy that power, distribute it so that economically it becomes viable. So the electricity authority of the state or the country would become involved in that case. The local authorities would be involved in that case because they have there sometime there is a conflict between the local authority and the plant owner and then the water pollution control board and the experts did find that at one given point the plant was not operating properly but then it improved because he was directed to make a huge investment for the purposes of introducing better segregation and the point of chimney where you know exhaust where the emissions are made the filters and other plant improvement upgradation was required to be done by them so that they could not cause pollution because they used to generate ash because see, there is a pond ash which is generated or the other ash from the chimney which spoils the environment so they could be injurious to your health so all this was taken into care then the government was even asked to take care of future because the waste is going to increase by the day it's not going to decrease so by the time it increases you must have plans ready in hand so that you can properly collect transport and dispose of the waste in accordance with the law and as far as practical and possible you should try to convert waste into value rather than dumping it indiscriminately and causing serious prejudice to the environment. Connected with this one of the main thing of uh, was the cleaning of river Yamuna in Delhi. Now, Yamuna, as you know, starts from Yamotri and through the Himachal, it comes to Haryana and from Haryana, it comes to Delhi and from Delhi, it goes and joins River Ganga. Now this, the concentration of pollutants in the river water was kind of not even worthy of noticing because it was flouting by God knows one is to lakhs ratio. So, you know, because the coliform, if permissible, was one eight hundred to one thousand. It was running in lakhs and lakhs and lakhs. So, same way the BOD, the you know COD and other chemicals, which were you know, and Yamuna was pretty bad. So we had to pass directions with regard to establishment of the, because sewage is one of the heaviest pollutant of Yamuna. Yeah, Yamuna falls in Delhi range around about 23 kilometers and it pollutes to the extent of 72% of the river's total pollution. So you can imagine how much mm -hmm. is the contribution of this waste into the you know industrial waste, sewage, normal waste being dumped and it being treated as nothing but a big uh, you know unfeasible nala 
So that was a very difficult and challenging case. We had to adopt all these principles. And that is the case where we first time tried what uh, Dr. Pandya has just referred, the consultative process of the stakeholders, because there were different states involved, you know, UP, Himachal, Haryana, Delhi, and plus, because see, you have to provide for the entire cleaning of the river. So it has to be a collective effort. So the people were concerned, you know, the sugarcane industry was consulted. The chemical industries, and then you know, there were a lot of electroplating industries which had to be shut down in Delhi. So there was quite a collective violation of law. When I talk of collective violation of law, it means that citizens, industries, and regulatory authorities, everybody was on the wrong side of the law. So it was a very challenging case. So we had to, we had to, then we appointed. Now here is the consultative process. So we invited all the state governments through their chief secretaries to participate in the meetings that we used to hold. Then we had appointed a special committee of the eight professors of the IITs of the country, the most famous IITs of the country. All professors were put together and they used to study the technical aspect, irrespective of the fact that we had technical experts with us. We wanted an absolutely acceptable, scientifically implementable and uh, practical solutions. So they were able to study. They were able to help us. Then we used to have that report of the IIT uh, consortium into the meetings of the consultative process. And we used to deliberate upon them before we pass. And then we finally pass a judgment of Yamuna, which itself was running into six to 700 pages. It provided everything. Who will provide the finances? Who will give you the uh, you know, materials? How many STPs you will put? How many drains will be created? How many? You know, stoppages, how many trains would be blocked from entering River Yamuna, and how many plants will be put up for treating the sewage or the industrial waste, and testing processes that will be followed. So it was a very comprehensive document which provided all the three that means the social obligations, economic obligations, the practical obligations and implementable obligation and regulatory measures that the state was taken. So it was a kind of a very challenging uh, thing for us and be able to sort of do it quite effectively. And it did show some results. But now with COVID-19, I'm told that Yamuna itself has cleaned a lot. So once the human undesirable interference with the natural resources stops, it will certainly improve in terms of quality, in terms of quantity, and it will definitely add to better environment. Now, in Yamuna's case, we even have to create biodiversity parks because you have to improve the biodiversity of the river banks. Otherwise, they will always be a source of pollution rather than cleaning because See, the biodiversity parks and the biodiversity on the river bank is a source of cleaning the rivers and refreshing the river uh, water. So this was a comprehensive kind of a thing that we used to do. There are cases, lots of cases. And I, you know, if we start discussing, probably I think you will have to have days and days and days to spend. So, which I don't think we have that kind of a time. So, these are the few examples I thought I'd share. But uh, in our country, I'm very happy to inform you that uh, the Supreme Court, the High Courts, and the National Human Tribunal are doing a great job. You know, they have even adopted the principles of judicial creativity for the purposes of serving the environmental justice, which ultimately serve the people at large because I would uh, to end with it just give you an example you have to be sure how what do you want do you want five star hospitals 
to treat you at a huge expense or would the government and all other bodies and the citizens should take precautions and spend money on health care so that you don't fall sick so is it better not to fall sick so that you don't go to hospital or should you fall sick and pay for being treated all through your career so if you are doing all this i feel that we as citizens have to do our duty to ensure that the environmental protections are done more effectively and we all work together the government the regulatory agencies the pollution control boards the people and you know the resident associations everybody should get together and work in the interest of environment so that there is better environment because that we really need you've seen with the COVID that our way of life has changed now we start working from home that's what you are doing on this webinar you have uh, you know waste collection is much different now people are very conscious of hygiene so there is uh, you know less traffic on the road so we have to regulate these things obviously you have to go back to normal life but you have to regulate yourself and stop all undesirable human intervention with natural resources with these words i thank everybody for having provided me an opportunity of speaking to all of you thank you so much hello sir hello. yes thank you so much for uh, on such a important topic today so we have a question to uh, ask you with your permission tell me yes yes please go ahead yes sir uh, in your views in the last 10 years of functioning has the ngt been successful in fulfilling its objectives for which it, it, it has been uh, developed as a separate body because there are so many controversies uh, regarding the working of NGT since its inception. What would you say about this? No, I think, uh, see, uh, controversies always exist. I don't think, I have not seen any institution free of controversy. So the controversies do arise. But I think the National Green Tribunal, by and large, has been able to do effective work for which it is being or it has been constituted. So, because its main job is to do environmental dispensation of environmental justice, which I think it has been doing pretty fairly. I don't think there is. Rest, of course, the controversies is part of in our systems. So I don't think we should be worried about that much. Yes. Okay, sir. Uh, could you could you please kindly discuss a few landmark cases uh, wherein judgments have been delivered for land, air and water protection as you uh, gave example of Bangalore that once upon a time it had been a very beautiful uh, city and then it has been polluted in just like that, can you give a few Sorry, examples? Uh, uh, Dr. Mehta, your voice is cracking, please. I couldn't hear the question. Uh, could you please discuss a uh, few landmark cases wherein judgments have, have been delivered for land, air, or water protection? As you gave example of Bangalore city, that once it had been a beautiful city, and then uh, slowly and gradually due to uh, the, the industrial development, it got deteriorated. Can you just uh, discuss few of the landmark cases with us, which land and water protection is there? Yeah. See, firstly, uh, you know, when I told you we have the Yamuna case, we have uh, Ganga case, and uh, then uh, water, we have, I told you, the Bengaluru case, 
then we have even uh, you know people were so conscious that even for a small pond in delhi which was the old pond of water people came to the tribunal because they were apprehending that people will occupy that by putting mud into it so people were very concerned so there were a few water cases which have been then i told you the glaciers was a very important case which was uh, with regard to the glaciers in uh, himalayan because they are all eco sensitive uh, area and uh, you know our glaciers were melting practically nearly uh, you know 1 km per year no sorry 1 meter per year and that was very serious so we had to pass directions for restoration of forest area there restoration and non interference of human beings with the glaciers beyond uh, in a very regulated manner limited vehicles to go because the large number of vehicles used to go and they used to put a lot of diesel there which will spoil the ice and therefore the water as well as air pollution so things were so these were glacier cases then we had uh, you know waste cases as i told you land we had because lot of land which was under the forest area people were trying to wipe out the forest areas and trying to make uh, you know indiscriminate construction so you had to interfere it was uh, in uttarakhand it was in himachal pradesh it was in madhya pradesh it was in uh, maharashtra so uh, they have been where the land was being converted for illegal uses and was not in accordance with law then very interesting case which i think may be of some interest to the students and the attendees would be the ship sinking case and the you know uh, the oil spilling case in mumbai that was a ship which had come to bombay from kuwait and uh, you know it was uh, in a bad shape it was probably the allegation was that it was made to sunk intentionally in the indian waters because the india doesn't take very serious action against the people who leave the ships there and uh, you know dismantling of a ship practically cost you as good or as bad as like a new ship so one of the easiest economic uh, advantage is that you just dump it somewhere let it sunk and probably the indian waters were found to be and it was around about i think 18 nautical miles from bombay shore so that was a case where we dealt very strongly and we find the company 100 crores and uh, which owned the ship then even the consignee was fined and there were directions were issued that then a study had to be carried out whether the company should be ordered to lift the ship and break it and take it back or it should be permitted to leave there so one initial report was that breaking it and lifting it up itself will cause a lot of pollution and may affect the aquatic life uh, you know difficulty so we had to take a call on that and we didn't ask for the ship to be lifted and i don't know if they're converting into something else there only so the basic thing was what i mean that there was a lot of international uh, you know we had to rely upon on what 11 international treaties or agreements and the declaration of the ship for uh, being seaworthy so there was very interesting questions of law and we really invoked polluter based principle in this case and we held that the oil uh, uh, seepage uh, of the the oil spill to the shore which had come which killed fish and spoiled the mangroves you know so we import that's why we took so much of the course to the polluter based principle and pass certain direction so these were the few cases which were quite important to look at okay. thank you so much sir for elaborative uh, explanation for the same um sir there is so much confusion regarding the uh, jurisdiction of ngt 
these are um, i mean we we, uh, we think many of the students are asking the questions regarding the jurisdiction of ngt there are so much confusion uh, regarding to that um, which would come under uh, even high court and supreme court how much authority they will be having into such cases and where ngt can uh, take up can you know so you are correct see the jurisdiction of ngt is very clearly stated i don't see a reason for any confusion because see the ngt has jurisdiction over seven acts which have been stated in schedule 1 to the ngt act so those seven acts cases should be tried and dealt with by the ngt and it's a special jurisdiction given to ngt so normally the high courts and the supreme court does not interfere but the jurisdiction of the high court under article 226 is untouchable it cannot be uh, you know circumvented by any judgment or law of the parliament so uh, high courts can interfere there is uh, and in all but i've never seen high courts really interfering with the work of the tribunal mainly they yes in some cases uh, they can be point of law they can be point of jurisdiction they can be point of you know impacts so they can be possibility of the high honorable judges interfering on the work but by and large i don't think and the ngt jurisdiction is very specifically stated and they have and in fact most of the judgments of the supreme court and the high court have been uh, uh, you know uh, upholding the orders of the ngt i don't think there's any you know difficulty of any concurrent jurisdiction conflict i know okay sir as you mentioned seven acts and the ngt has power to hear uh, civil cases also so uh, but to which laws ngt has power to uh, hear civil cases as well along with the specifications no ngt mainly can only hear civil cases it does not have criminal jurisdiction uh, it will have to refer the matter to the magistrate if it wants any criminal action to be taken but uh, it has no jurisdiction it's just civil jurisdiction so the, all the cases to be tried by the ngt are civil cases uh, okay sir so do you suggest any changes to be incorporated in the existing pro process for filing an application or appeal before the ngt no i don't think so there is a very clean process and so, you know ngt is quite liberal on uh, entertaining applications so i don't think see the purpose of this act was to create easy access of environmental justice that was the basic object and i think people coming to ngt quite often you know, on issues which bother them they're quite Okay, sir. Um, could you please discuss the measure for punishment or fine taken by the NGT in case of non-compliance of the NGT order? Yes, in number of cases where the NGT directions were not initially carried out, so the people were issued notices, even the officials were issued notices, the industries were issued notices, the corporations were issued notices. in some of them then you impose some fine on them but gradually they have uh, you know a trend had set in that uh, orders were carried out so i don't think there was violation some industries which didn't do they have to pay very heavy environmental compensation so but i think the ngt orders were quite effective and i think Uh, sir could you please present your comment on few landmark uh, cases where few more action has been taken up by ngt for environmental protection mm, there were two three cases i think where uh, i am not very sure about the recent times but i think even recently also they have invoked so much to jurisdiction but uh, in the earlier times there was a shimla himachal case forest case where you know around about uh, 5 600 or 700 trees were cut overnight so that was a so motto on uh, newspaper a notice was taken and very it it went for some time 
and none of the courts interfered and uh, they did not find that the NGT orders were wrong. Then another case was Suomoto in Delhi where uh, this was uh, again an issue of water pollution. And then there was another case, if I don't mistake, of uh, I think one more case. There were two, three cases where Suomoto, uh, but nothing, nothing much. Uh, okay, sir. Forbidden punishment has been charged to the airing industries in the recent times. Uh, kindly give your valuable comments on that. No, see, it must be for good reasons because where the tribunal finds that, you know, uh, people have violated its directions or where the damage, environmental damage is very serious, uh, there definitely a heavier penalty is asked for. And I don't know which case are you referring to, but I think by and large, the principle of proportionality is applied by the tribunal. They do see that, uh, you know, for example, remedying the wrong done would be very expensive. So naturally, your quantum of uh, punishment or the penalty would be very high. I'm sure it is properly reasoned out before passing. Okay, thank you, sir. And uh, certain areas are declared as critically poll polluted areas by survey. And how far can we rely upon the administrative authorities like SPCB and others for the uh, data that has been given? No, see, this is a uh, subordinate legislative function because uh, under the Air Act, you have to identify, under the Water Act, you have to identify. It's, it's, it's a kind of a directive, statutory function that you carry out. So you are supposed to apply your mind, collect proper data before you, you know, can uh, identify, you know, for example, in the case of groundwater, you have to give, which is the highly depleted area, which is prohibited area, which is regulated area, air pollution, you have to identify the pockets where no industry, some industry, regulated industries. So these are, I think this are normally done after a proper study. I'm not sure if you know of some case, but normally they should be done after a proper study, field study done by the staff, and then it is recommended, and then notification is issued for declaring the areas. Okay, sir, we have uh, our live viewers are asking many questions. With your permission, okay. shall we just go with that, sir? Yeah, yeah. You can do, yes. Yes, sir. Yes, Dr. Parna Mukherjee, uh, who is professor, he wants to ask a question. How challenging is to implement both orders of NGP, especially with imposed heavy and exemplary fines under polluter based principles and under no fault liability? No, I did get it. What about it? <laughs> Can you please repeat your question? Uh, sure, sir. How challenging uh, is to implement those orders of NGP, especially which imposed uh, uh, exemplary fines under polluter based principle and under no fault liability? So, see, whenever uh, you know the fines are imposed or the compensation is, uh, you know fixed by the tribunal for remedying the wrongs which have been done. See, because normally the environmental compensation is imposed for damage to the environment or the likely damage that is to be you know, done. So I think there, as I told you, there must be some proportion somewhere. Right? It depends on the facts of a given case. Sometimes, you know, you might have caused a very small violation but its impact on water or environment or something was very serious. So therefore your penalty or the compensation properly term is environmental compensation would be definitely very high. So it is always and normally proportionate to the damage done by you to the environment. Okay, sir. Uh, 
thank you sir uh, our student ranak majmudar ranak wants to ask a question we are very uh, glad to very glad to make to you that uh, in gns law college we are having environmental law only having dlc and the master of no. ESL wants to ask a question to you that what happens what the views of an expert member and judicial member are opposite or are different who yeah. comes in the, and why yeah. the particular choice would be made no no see there is uh, i told you that the experts enjoy equal power as that of a judicial member if there is a difference of opinion between the judicial member and uh, the expert member the case is referred to a third member uh, by the chairman either the chairman himself would answer that question difference of opinion or he would constitute a larger bench to answer that so it is again dealt with on a very uh, judicially disciplined manner it's not uh, nobody's opinion is ever ignored okay thank you sir uh, so don't you think that uh, this difficult times have brought a silver line as the quality of event has improved with less of pollution and also the water bodies are more clean than before so uh, can you please give some suggestions regarding how the student or the citizens can contribute to the same no steam as i told you covid 19 is a very unfortunate even that has happened to the planet but then certain you know good things out of the bad thing has happened so firstly the people must continue the hygiene levels which they have built up you know second is that they must uh, ensure that the waste management is improved it has already improved so that see these are the thing then load of traffic on the roads should be reduced by permanently adopting the principle of work from home you know for example an industry is having uh, let's say 100 people as its employee it can make it a principle that for uh, one week 50 people will come 50 people will not come they will work from home and next week those 50 should come and these 50 should work at home so you to reduce the work load and therefore air pollution and everything you know damage to the road will be reduced but basically what you have to do is you have to be very careful i am telling you that water is a very big scare for us now because we are using water like you know i think solution to everything but we should be very careful and use the water very carefully because water shortage is the next challenge that probably the world is going to face and the students definitely can build up good habit continue them post 19 covid 19 as well and be environmentally conscious they should be very environmentally conscious because if you are environmentally conscious you will definitely ensure that there are health hazards are least faced by the society so they have a very positive role to play Okay. And you know, in our society, there's one big advantage: the students, that the young children, are always listened to. Their teachers will listen to them, their parents will listen to them, their friends will listen to them. So they have an advantage of three people having weakness for them. So if they create environmental consciousness, it will travel very fast. Thank, Thank you, you so much for such thoughtful input, sir. I'm sure that our viewers, our students, those who are listening to me right now, will definitely implement and will definitely work on the guidelines or the thoughts that you have shared on this platform, sir. Uh, next question uh, is from our student Priyal. She wants to ask that, with reference to the visa case, leak case, what are your views on the property of kind of liability that will be imposed? Sorry, um, Dr. Mehta, your voice is really cracking. Okay, uh, it is with the reference to visa case, leak case. Uh, the student wants to know that what are your views on the property of kind of liability that will be imposed? 
to be imposed. I mean, it should be absolute liability or strict liability. No, no. See, it's very difficult to lay down tests in abstract. You know, the, the basic feature of our legal system is that it deals with it case to case basis. So, a view has been taken, and it seems to be the view which should prevail. Because, uh, see, the absolute liability may create the uh, dimensions of a different kind, which will have far-reaching consequences. So, therefore, I think the view accepted and taken is quite a fair view taken, I think. Okay, so the next question is the continuation that what are uh, what is the role of NGT or what is the development from the time between Gopal Gay's tragedy to Vizag Gay's league? Well, see, now, uh, See, Bhopal gas was uh, a matter taken up by the Supreme Court when the environmental jurisprudence had not developed in our country. You know, in fact, Bhopal gas is the foundation of development of environmental jurisprudence in India. But today, the Bhopal gas is again, uh, there is lot of development at the national and the international level. As I told you that the global impact of environmental laws is bound to affect the domestic laws. So today we have a much wider and much uh, you know effective environmental jurisprudence in the country and that's why I told you that it will be a view which the courts will have to take that uh, you know in fact if you see the provisions of the ngt it applies the principle of absolute liability you know it doesn't uh, give the principle of uh, you know uh, other uh, responsibilities but the content of the law is the onus is on the polluter he has to show that he has not polluted it even the primary onus is on him. All the polluter applicant has to show is that something untoward has happened having environmental impact. So the principle of, uh, you know, is principle of uh, absolute liability has been retracted in our cases a lot. Yes, please. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, now our student, the most bad student Lakshmi wants to ask a question that as with the shift of China market to India, sorry, so as with shift of China's market to India, soon mm -hmm. India will be clearing lands for new investors, and government has proposed some amendments in environmental laws. So we would like to know your opinion on such amendments that are proposed to the government. No, see, these proposed amendments are probably, I think, if you are referring to the EIA notification amendments, where they are uh, talking about. So, see, it doesn't matter. You know, they one of the, yes, where you are trying to completely, uh, you know, wipe out the law for uh, development, then it may not be very uh, environment friendly. But where you are doing time very, uh, you know, variations, you are doing authority variations, you are reducing time limits, that's a okay if you can do it. If the government believes that it can do, uh, you know, the work instead of 100 and uh, 320 days, it can do it 120 days. Fair enough, what's wrong in it? If they can do it. So, question is that you should be able to deal with the issue and provide a remedy to it. Rest of the things are ancillary. I don't think uh, things would matter that way. So I don't think there can be prejudice per se. And I don't know whether that law comes through or not. What, what will happen? The government may be still examining it. But basically, if the government feels competent to do compliances to environmental concerns, so then there are, I think there is no damage. 
okay thank you sir this now this question is we would be taking last but it is very important the answer of this question is very important for us sir uh, any scope for ngt internship and judicial training for those students who really want to pursue career in environmental fields yeah i think uh, earlier ngt used to keep interns i think that was a regular feature we used to make selections from all the colleges and uh, keep the students for uh, even law clerks were kept from there i'm not very sure about this now what is happening but i think it's a very good thing if the students who are interested in environmental laws they could even opt for uh, asking uh, the people you know to, uh, the judges or the institution to permit them to work as interns it's a very i think it's a very appreciable effort if the students want to do it and say so i have uh, absolutely no problem and if uh, anybody wants to get in touch with my office they are free to get in touch there is no difficulty at ngt i am not very sure what is happening now but earlier it used to have a regular feature of law clerks and interns from law colleges that was there okay uh, thank you so much sir for okay. uh, for just uh, i think telling us that our students can contact your office if they are into training and you are doing as i said sir that we have uh environment law clinic in the jail of college under the guidance guidance of dr mayuri pandya uh, is also a uh, member at uh, national uh, at national level too at certain places uh, she is also on the board and um, under her guidance we are just working and doing environmental activities and the law guidance in the future we would love to do many activities as you said students are having uh, pre wings uh, support system they can have support system from uh, their friends their uh, teachers and their parents so just following the suggestions we would love to work on that guidelines and we are of the law college we are thankful to you for uh, for giving us your valuable answer and we are indeed very grateful to you for sharing your view your uh, valuable time and uh, it is an enlightening an enlightening session for all the viewers and all the law students and those who are attending your session again thank you so much sir we are looking for uh, many services as you said that if you start speaking it will take days and days to narrate all the experiences and all your experiences we would love to have separate expert sessions to be held sir will you okay thank you thank so you so i'll leave now yes sir.